everybody, it's T. Falcon Napier. Welcome to Circle of Brilliance. Today we are going to continue and perhaps even finish up our discussion on the Mastery Stream strategic framework and specifically how it might be playing itself out in your interactions with your clients and prospective clients. And so we've spent a good deal of time now talking about phase one and phase two and uh, time to get into the, the stuff about phase three, because uh, while I think that most of the problems that human development professionals tend to experience when it comes to managing tension more most effectively is that they give up on the questioning too soon. They don't get deep enough into the questioning, and that's where we're going to pick up, by the way, as we get into this. And so we need to make sure we're doing a thorough, thorough, thorough job of uh, using our questioning techniques to get all the information we really need to lead that, uh, that individual on their path of self-discovery so they realize what's really going on, what the gap's all about, and they're feeling sufficient tension about the situation to follow through and actually do something about it. Once we're beyond that point, the whole uh, order of business now changes to protecting the level of tension. We really don't want it to go down. You see where I'm squiggling around here in phase three, which is the solving phase right there in invisible letters. You see the word solving. Solving phase is where we're going to be coming up with recommendations, providing solutions, co-creating strategies, whatever fits into your modality. But this is where the remedy gets to be discussed and explored. Well, unfortunately, the, just the sheer knowledge that a solution is available has what impact on your level of productive tension? David's unmuted, so you get to answer it. So just the awareness that a solution is available does what to your level of tension? It reduces it, of course. It does, even though you've not done anything definitive, just the awareness alone, a little bit of reassurance allows people to breathe a sigh of relief, find some comfort in knowing that a solution is readily oh, available. Oh, you mean that can be fixed? Yeah, exactly right. In fact, David was sharing before we started the recording today that he has to uh, have uh, some dental work done. And so did, did this get prompted because you were in some discomfort, David? Um, no, I went and had a cleaning. They did x-rays and there is right, a tooth yeah. that is, yeah, so yeah. So it's almost like preventative before this becomes a painful experience, before this yes. becomes a bigger deal, the time for us to, to perform an intervention is now. Now, had you been in pain, again, you could all unmute and chime in on this. Had David actually been in true physical pain in that moment, how quickly do you think he would have been willing to let the extraction occur? Immediately. <laughs> right. It's kind of like no time like the present. Numb me up. Let's get going. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, um, but if it's not causing you any sort of actual pain, well, then um, you feel that sense of relief knowing, well, I can wait and schedule it in so it's a bit more convenient or, you know, plan accordingly because, you know, you're not going to feel all that great for the rest of that day and maybe not the following day. And so, you know, you can plan accordingly. So the tension goes down. Well, what do you think happens if the dentist tells you you need to have an extraction, that you're feeling no pain around whatsoever, you delay scheduling the appointment and, you know, the week that passes, two weeks it passes, whatever it is, you're kind of going like, actually, I'm feeling pretty good. What do you think? Is there a possibility you might just skip the whole extraction till uh, the situation gets worse on its own? What do you think happens to the average patient who's feeling no real discomfort? Absolutely. Right, you let it go. You let it go because we have a rule that governs human behavior. People pay what? What's the other? They pay attention to where they find their tension. tension. No tension, no attention. And so you can see what's going on. And so this is what we're trying to protect right here. Keep in mind that as we were asking all these questions, uh, at least two kinds of tension came into play. Now, I'm not talking about relationship tension and task tension. I'm talking a little bit more about the tension that is in the reality of the immediate situation and the tension that is anticipated uh, moving forward. So you guys, if you're selling something, you know that sometimes you're selling something to take care of the pain of today. And sometimes you're trying to be a little bit more proactive so that you can minimize or prevent altogether the pain of the future. T, well, in this, yep. in, this, in this practice, they have a person who does nothing but sell the implant. 
Well, you, and, you and I dad. want you to know she could use a little master stream. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, they all could. They, they they didn't get any training in sales when they went through whatever their their dental training happened to be. But yeah, mm -hmm. implants are massive business, massive, massive business. So cosmetic dentistry is going is always going to be a lot more lucrative than uh, corrective kinds of dentistry stuff. Okay. I think this is a good conversation, though, because a lot of times, at least from a patient perspective, there are things that cause your attention, right? The yeah. pain itself beckons your attention, but you don't necessarily just go out and do something about it. Some people just defer it or, you know, kind of delay it. Yep, that's absolutely right. Something's got to get your attention before you will pay attention to it. And so it's got to cause you attention. That's how the whole thing works. Now, Brian could explain neurochemically what, uh, what's involved in getting us to focus more and more on some things. But I imagine that's going to be the higher levels of, um, of adrenaline, perhaps. What makes us focus, Brian? Yeah, the acetylcholine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so alertness and focus and does pain trigger acetylcholine release it will but it also will trigger the adrenaline and you know then of course if the adrenaline becomes even worse then you're um, you know you get the norepinephrine rather then you get into the adrenaline yep 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 all right so you know obviously your body is doing what it's doing and um it's all about getting you to pay attention to something. So if there's a threat in your environment, whatever it is, pay attention to it. If you are in some sort of pain or discomfort, pay attention to it and, uh, and then you know follow it through until it either resolves or um, it um, you know, goes away of its own accord. Okay, anywho, uh, so, uh, so we're gonna be, be thinking very much about how we protect this level of tension. Oh, I keep doing that. How we are going to protect this level of tension when we get into our presentation phase, but we still have a little bit of work left to do about bringing our questioning to closure. So last time around, I said, you know, after you do a good job on the green, what do you want? as your first question, what do you hope to gain? What do you hope to lose? Uh, and then we pull it up a little bit into black, uh, still green, but kind of a, if a black and green got blended together, what would that even be? You know, a dark, 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 foresty, murky kind of a green. Um, we're talking about what do you not want to gain and what do you not want to lose. Now, when we really get up into the black step, though, what we are looking for are the obstacles. And there tends to be four categories of obstacles that prevent uh, humans from being successful uh, in whatever it is. So we describe these as the four root causes of um, struggle and failure uh, in humans. And I said they all start with un, and last time I said it's about unaware, unable, unwilling, unsuitable. And we spent some time last time around talking about the unaware piece of the whole puzzle. Uh, a great deal of the time, what we are trying to do in our role as human development professionals is to help our client, our prospective client, to become aware of something they never even realized. And now that they have that awareness, and awareness often brings with it increased knowledge and increased understanding, they can now change their perspective on it, make a decision, change a decision, whatever it is that seems to be appropriate in the situation. So a lot of the work that we do happens to um, fall into the category of, of creating awareness or bringing awareness to somebody. Now, the second uh, type of uh, root cause uh, issues uh, are described as issues of being unable to do something. So unable. Now, you know, we have an ability scale over here. And we talk about ability has a bunch of little things that contribute to it overall. So we talk about ability as being about knowledge and skill and experience and the availability of core physical resources. Now, as I already said, uh, knowledge kind of starts to tip its toe into awareness sorts of things. Uh, but we now get to those other two, skill and experience. So when someone says to you, I can't do that, what is a question you tend to ask right away as a follow-up question for that? I can't do that. Do what? Do all right, do what? And they'll tell you, I can't um, I can't accomplish that goal. I, I can never do that. Yeah, I, I've got one of those right now, T. I've got a leader who is a project manager and on it like a dog with a bone. 
And in terms of caring about other people, it just doesn't fit into the equation. Mm -hmm. So can't do that. Can't care about the people and still get the project done. Right. Okay. And so it's interesting that the word can't is what is often used when someone's talking about or giving you uh, a glimpse into the possibility of there being an ability gap. Um, in linguistic terms, if you guys go back to any kind of training you've gone through in neurolinguistic programming, you might have learned that there are 13 different linguistic violations that uh, we routinely commit all day, every day, in order to make communication possible. One of those is well, are called modal operators of possibility. Modal operators of possibility are words we use to indicate that there is some sort of barrier that is actually going to prevent us from doing something. So when I say I can't do something, that's a modal operator of possibility. And the way to challenge a modal operator of possibility is to say, what exactly is stopping you? And um, who knows, they may very well come up with something that's real, but more often than not, they're just using the word can't um, and uh, when really can't isn't true. What may very well be true is it's not going to be easy, but something that's not easy doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, and so often uh, we find that people use can't as a way of, how do I put this? Um, as a way of justifying an unwillingness, and we'll get to that in a second, an unwillingness to put any effort into doing what actually what they actually could do. So David, in the situation you've just described, is can't a legitimate assessment? No, it's unwilling. It's unwilling. Now, maybe there's an ability issue. Maybe he's just has no experience with it. And, you know, it's not his nature to kind of do that. So it isn't where his mind uh, kind of um, naturally uh, falls and where his behavior naturally, um, oh. you know, maybe that's just it. So it's out of character for him. It's well, it's a her. It's a it's her. A her okay. and, and she and her husband are both British. Just okay. as additional information. And so do you think there's also kind of like a cultural um, aspect into uh, how ready, willing, and able people are to deal with human issues, with people issues? I, it seems to be a common thread amongst them both, although her husband, who is the VP of operations, does a better job of pulling people in. Okay. Um, it, it, it really seems to be her. Yeah, well, I bring that up because I've certainly worked with plenty of cultures out there, and there are some cultures who, when you bring up people developing better people skills, uh, when they're interacting with their employees, they kind of just look at you like, these people are adults, I shouldn't have to really, you know, culturally, their thought is like, people, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, this but that's a cultural a term. Thing. I think Kathy may uh, understand the term better than me, but I ran across a term in some research about athletes that are high performers, and the term was called sociological imagination. And oh, so it, sociological um, imagination imagination and it's the ability to uh see the context which shapes your decision your individual decision making as well as decision made by others hmm. so yeah it was it's an interesting concept i think they they uh forget who created who it, it? it's been used in sociology uh, sociology for a long time and in the study, this idea about excellence, they said that sociological imagination plays a key role in that. Right. C. Wright Mills in 1959. Yeah, it's been around for a long time. Yeah, the sociological imagination to describe the type of insight offered by the discipline of sociology. Now, Kathy, your background is in sociology and anthropology, or where you know, it's anthropology, I mean, it's anthropology, but I certainly studied a lot of sociology. They're close allies. Um, anthropology is much more cross-cultural. Sociology was founded more US-based kind of, uh, you know, a, a different kind of concept. But but yeah, I mean, to me, that's, that's context. It's the understanding, the ability and willingness to understand the broader um, sociological, socioeconomic, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, ecosystem context of something. And a lot of that 
is does depend on i mean there are personality types who really truly have difficulty with that i mean there there is you know if you believe in myers briggs and 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 that type of thing there there really are personality types that just don't want to go there you yeah, know yeah they, are, they just aren't conceptual enough to go there and and emotionally um broad enough to want to go there um but it is it it does make the difference between people who can succeed in both high level positions um in whatever the calling is and in global positions because if you don't have that you're just you're you're you're, you're absolutely missing most of the context of the work and can't get things done because you're unable to imagine uh both strategically, you know, what, what is going to be happening, but also how people experience their world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really interesting because I'm going to ask you guys a gifted students question in just a second, but uh, um, it's all going to be about where on the change grid do you think this all lives? But let me give you the def definition I just found on sociological imagination, at least this is one part of it. Sociological imagination is the capacity to shift from one perspective to another. To have a sociological imagination, the person must be able to pull away from the situation and think from an alternative point of view. It requires us to, quote, think ourselves away from our daily routines and look at them anew, end quote. To acquire knowledge, it is important to break free from the immediacy of personal circumstances and put things into a wider context rather than following a routine. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So we're on the change grid. Would we do the best job of that? Sounds like the center. Yes. The center. Like the yeah. Got to yeah. be able to detach ourselves. Um, and that is, by the way, going back to this whole idea about unaware, unable. Um, it's interesting that I think dealing with the sociological imagination or doing something to awaken someone's sociological imagination does give them the ability to perhaps not acquire new awareness, but to exercise the awareness they already have in a new and different way. Right, um, that's what this research was showing in these um, professional athletes, because they said they don't depend on the talent per se, but they're able to, in each situation, they call it operating in different worlds. So they're able to connect the dots in, the, in, in real time, so to speak. And I think that's quite unique when you're talking about even like this sales process and you're you're helping people to access something that they already have instead of them acquiring something new. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can comment here for a minute. Um, I, I did a, a couple of years ago, did a very deep um, competency analysis for a major um, biotech uh company that for their high, very high level, highly paid um, marketing people that work across the products. You know, they work, they work across stakeholders and across products and they're considered the elite of the marketing uh, people. And that was came out as the primary, one of, one of the primary top competencies for that group was the capacity to connect the dots and, um, and see the kind of see the kind of big picture. Not only see the kind of big picture, but absolutely act on the big picture based on their ability to connect dots and and create strategies based on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really, very interesting. Very interesting stuff. Um, you know, uh, tell me how this fits in, Kathy. Uh, going to David's example. Um, could someone, could a lack of, so, of sociological imagination limit one's um, understanding of the range of possibilities in their own life? So okay. if they, you know, if they're not dealing with the social issues of working with their employees, um, yeah, I might have said enough, but what, uh, you, any thoughts yeah. about that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. That, that's what I was saying. If you don't have that, it's very unlikely that other in a other than a pure technical track, you would be able to move into and successfully manage over time uh, an executive role, you know, 
in a, yep, in a yep, 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 yep. Um, uh, or other kinds of roles that require um, global efficacy. Um, you know, whether, but, but yeah, it, it, it's totally limiting not to be able to do that. And, and, and it cuts off your ability to learn essentially yep. right because you're you're implying your own restrictions on yourself um that are false uh, false re restrictions which is the whole point of a motor op modal operator of possibility you're, you're putting a wall up around yourself for no real benefit to anyone other than it protects you obviously or at least you think you think it does you know i'm kind of um thinking about a real situation that occurred yesterday um i popped over to the grocery store and um we have a cat and our cat is a very finicky eater and she only likes one particular brand of food and she only likes one particular flavor within that food. Now, of course, I do understand that if she got hungry enough, she'd eat whatever. But, um, you know, we're trying to be good cat parents. Well, I don't know how many of you have have pets, but have you noticed that the availability of pet food is becoming more and more and more limited? Yes, so, and we have to go to more and more stores to find you know, we have two dogs and, and I, I just guarantee you there's only certain foods that they're going to eat and it's harder to find. Yep. And so a lot of this has to do with our current supply chain backlog kind of stuff. So, you know, give that another year and maybe that'll get itself sorted out. But in the meantime, uh, this is what, what I was going to share is that there were people who are talking about like like we're all going to like suffer and starve and and you know everything is going to fall apart because instead of having 12 different options in a particular item in the grocery store we now only have eight or nine and we don't have quite as much and i had to laugh because i went like y'all have never been to panama have you <laughs> it's like this is a usual day at the grocery store so i thought like you know when we try to apply in fact there's a line here that says that um sociological imagination is really about applying your own personal life situation in the context of various social societal situations so within the u.s this might feel very unfamiliar because it's the first time in my lifetime that i've seen availability of things be compromised um, but you know if you're someone who travels around the world or you've lived in other places around the world you know that scarcity is simply a way of life for so many of them and they seem to be doing okay so, but, yeah. but you know t that's where you know role reversal is is so important because it allows people to walk a mile in the other person's shoes and it it it, it changes their perceptual field and yes. you know what i'm saying and, i do i do yeah. okay yeah yeah yeah, there's a, a great YouTube channel if you're ever like looking for something interesting to watch. But uh, yeah, the channel is Yoel and Mari, J O E L, Yoel and Mari, M A R I. Joel has recently immigrated from Cuba, and Mari is an American, but of Cuban descent. And she lived in Cuba for a while. I don't know the, the, the details about how they were able to move around, but one way or another, through a very long, fascinating, but convoluted story, um, they were able to get uh, Joel into the United States. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, do you know where the U.S. Embassy to Cuba is physically located anybody know i thought it was in miami it's in guiana in guiana right they had to fly from cuba to guiana in order to go to an american embassy that could handle cuban issues wow. is that crazy look at a map guiana is nowhere near wow. <laughs> oh, crazy. Well, why is that does anybody know why that would be it's crazy i have no idea i have no idea oh. But uh, that's where that's what they had to do. It's explained in their in their videos. It really is intriguing. But I, I'm giving you this big backstory just to share one simple little thing. Um, so, of course, you know, she's trying to show him some interesting things about the U.S. And he only wants to go two places. He wants to see what a Walmart looks like. And he wants to go to Home Depot. 
In both of these videos where he goes into these stores, he is at first overwhelmed by mm -hmm. the variety of things that are available, the size of it, all that sort of stuff. But within about 10 minutes of his time in there, he becomes so emotionally distraught that he has to leave. And it's because he, he, he thinks about all of his friends and family members who are still living in Cuba, who have never seen such a thing, probably never will see such a thing, and certainly won't be able to experience it. And for him, it is an emotionally devastating kind of an experience. So I brought that up just to say that sometimes when our our personal situation actually gets physically moved into a different societal situation. Um, it's unpredictable what someone's response may be. You know, me, we might have thought, oh, he's going to be a kid in a candy store. And he saw the toy section and burst into tears because he has a daughter with a previous wife who's still in Cuba and who would love to have one Barbie, not, not the 30 different Barbies that are on the shelf in this Walmart. Mm -hmm. So very interesting thing to just see what happens when someone's personal situation gets, um, um, you know, applied to. And I know this whole idea about sociological imagination is about imagining yourself into the other society or how this might play out in a different societal situation. Well, what happens if you actually find yourself plunked into it? You know, I have to tell you, T, I see all these people coming from uh, from um, 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 uh, Haiti and and and, you know, these uh, triangle countries and everything else. And, and I, I'm starting to have a lot more empathy for them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because, again, that, I think, is what they're talking about for sociological imagination. At a certain level of awareness, you begin to project yourself into their reality. And when you can do that, and at least, even though it's a tiny, tiny um, ex, uh, re what's it, resonance with their experience, their actual experience, it's enough to trigger someone to kind of go like, no, I'm starting to get it. <laughs> I, I, I get it. Um, someone trying to sell if I can just If I can just comment here, I do, you know, cross-cultural coaching that I do, even people do get overwhelmed. I mean, part of culture shock for people is going into the Home Depot or going into a stop and shop. It's actual culture shock yeah. to, to go in and deal with that. And, and, um, and it, and it creates anxiety yep. over choice, over the numbers of choices and not knowing what to do, especially if the language is an issue. Um, it's, it's incredibly difficult, even for people who come from, you know, relatively prosperous countries. Oh, right. and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, because things will be different. Um, yeah, and then um, it's interesting how um, in these in on this channel, she's also using this as a as a learning moment. Like when he saw this one cereal that he's always wanted to try, he wants to grab three or four boxes of it, and he goes, "Well, they might not have it next time." Now we all have to laugh and go like, yeah, maybe you should grab it because they may not have it next time. But you know, in our normal experience of um, retail uh in the united states we would just kind of go like it'll be here <laughs> it might even be on sale <laughs> so just you know I'll just grab one and you know we'll get more next time um okay anyway that's a that's a nice little addition so thank you brian for bringing up sociological imagination again we think it belongs in the center of the change grid now let me bring this up to you guys what do you think happens to your client's level of productive tension if you decide to put a little bit of a sociological imagination exercise into the discussion or the work you're doing with them? What effect might that have on their level of tension? Um, it, could lower it. it could lower it and tell us about that situation. Well, in, in you're, you're empathizing for a different set of circumstances. And I think anytime you empathize, you know, your own level of tension goes down. Right. Absolutely right. I, I would argue that if you're injecting it in the opposite way, in mm -hmm. other words, broadening the scope for someone who has not, for whom it has not been broader before, it would actually increase tension. And that's what I wanted you guys to kind of realize is that sociological imagination becomes a bit of a change grid maneuver. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And it could be an upgrade maneuver. It could be a downgrade maneuver. I'll bet you anything we could also make it be both an outgrade and an ingrid maneuver. In fact, David shared that now he kind of understands a little bit more. What kind of a maneuver did that end up um, being then, you know, when suddenly you kind of move towards amiability? An ingrid, an ingrid maneuver. It's a bit of an ingrid maneuver. And oh. so, yeah, go ahead, Edie. Or who was about to speak? Linda, I just had a. When you said that about upgrid and downgrid, um, I was thinking that when I went to Russia and we were in the bus driving down the road, um, we saw a line coming out of a building. And when we asked our person that was a yeah, tour guide or well, it wasn't a tour guide, but you know, yeah. they keep us in the bus, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> doing the right thing. Uh, she said, well, bread came in this morning. So I feel like I felt sad, really sad. Like what? Yeah. What? Yeah. You have to jump into a line to get a loaf of bread. And then here's the other side that this was just why I wanted to make this comment. When I got home and I saw all these stores filled with all these things, I was sad again but in an embarrassed way yeah interesting so it was yep. a it was such a different upgrade downgrade <laughs> yeah and so and so maybe this whole scarcity issue or supply line issue we're all experiencing right now is going to be a little bit of a humbling experience for the average american you know <laughs> maybe it's going to be oh look a little bit of inconvenience in the world of retail so here you go maybe oh by the way prices go up What's that, well, Brian? We're, we're feeling it here in Michigan quite quite dramatically. Yeah? Yeah. You know, with with cars and with chips. Well, that's true, but that's been an issue for um that wasn't was the chip issue even pre-pandemic? Might no. have been. I yeah, I think that that had been bubbling for a while. I don't remember what the core issue yeah, was there around. There were tariff, tariff relationships there. Yeah. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. So um we also had a friend who's from Ukraine, and uh, she shared with us at one point that sometimes when she was uh, growing up and they saw a line forming outside of a store, they just automatically got in the line. They didn't even know what they were in the line for, but they figured it's better to get in the line and then figure out what it is. And so then like communication would travel up and down the line to find out what it really is that they're standing in line for. So if there's a line, get in it because they might have something that you actually want, mm -hmm. actually want. Um, okay, anyway. Let's, get, let's uh, get, get back to finishing our uns. Oh, by the way, one little matter of business. Remember, for the next few weeks, I'm, I'm going to be out of pocket. And so if you guys would like to continue the calls, um, I'm going to ask for a volunteer, David, who will uh, who could start the calls if you guys want to continue to, to chat um, or if you want to just do it once a week, whatever. But I need to give somebody our, um, our credentials for getting into um, uh, Zoom and all that. So do you guys you have know, any thoughts I, about that? I, I had considered that, T, and I'd be, I'd be uh, pleased and proud to do that. Okay, then, um, then David, um, between now and uh, um, I, I, I don't leave until Tuesday, I'll make sure that I get you fully equipped with, it, with whatever's going on. That means everyone, you're still going to receive your new, your usual uh, reminders about the circle of brilliance. You guys just assume it's all going to be happening. I'll give David some ideas about subjects that he might want to bring up um, uh, for you guys and all that. So, uh, but but do keep this going. I I hate the thought. As much as I need to get away for a little bit of a vacation, I hate the thought that the momentum that we've created with these calls is going to suffer because I'm out, um, you know, for a few weeks time. Okay, anyway, we'll take care of that. So, uh, yeah, David, I'll, we'll make sure you're fully equipped. Oh, by the way, Linda will still be around. She's not going. So, uh, but she's she's uh, right, she's got a exercise class, and she ends up joining this call about ten minutes late. So I want to make sure David can get the call started and then Linda can still be around if there's some questions that uh, you want to run by Linda about anything. Yeah. Uh, changing my training time till nine. Oh, right, because I won't be using it. Okay, well, there you go. So between Linda and David, it'll all be fine. Okay, so un unable. Now, unable means that there is some uh, gap in their uh, knowledge. And I'm talking about book knowledge now rather than general awareness. 
skill uh, and experience. Now that's the domain of training. In fact, we say in pride-based leadership that if there's an issue of unawareness, uh, then that's a management issue because the manager role has at its core, this idea about managing awareness. And if you really think about what a manager does and what people need from their manager, you're going to find out that word awareness is going to come up more and more and more. What am I supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to do it? How much do I need to get done? What's so-and-so doing? What's or what's happening with this, blah, blah, blah. So if you really want to go, what does a manager actually manage? Um, it's going to have that uh, information at its core that's keeping people fully aware of what's going on um, all across the spectrum. So anytime we're dealing with an issue of unawareness, an issue of awareness rather, then uh, that's the manager in us that's coming forward. If it is an issue of being unable to do something, that's calling upon the trainer inside of each of us to step up and give people the knowledge and give people the skill and give people the experience in whatever form that all takes. That's what, that's what it takes to deal with an issue of, of being unable unable to do something. Now, again, we're bringing this up because in your work with your clients, sooner or later, you've got to put together an appropriate scope of work. How are you going to go about helping them get to whatever it is that they just revealed they really wanted in all four aspects um, down here at the beginning of the um, or the earlier stages of questioning? Well, now I got to know what form is it going to take? So do I need to be their manager? Do I need to be their trainer? Or let's go to the next one. And that is issues of unwillingness. Now, unwillingness is a really uh, interesting uh, root cause because it's the, the, um, the only one that we've actually uh, realized what I'm about to say to hold true. And that is there is a primary willingness issue and there is also a secondary willingness issue. I'll explain secondary willingness issues first so you know what's going on. If someone is unaware of something, that's their root cause. Would you be surprised to find out they're also unwilling to do it? No. No. Or if they're unable to do something, that's the true root cause. They're unable to do something. Would you be surprised to find out they're also unwilling to do it? No. 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 And we'll even jump ahead to the third possibility or the last possibility is that it's unsuitable. It doesn't match them. It's just not appropriate for them to do. If that's their primary, that's the true root cause, would you be surprised to also find out that they seem unwilling? No. no. But in those conversations, do you think that person is going to say to you, um, I don't know if something I need to know? or I don't have some skill or knowledge that I need to have, or I don't really think this is a good match for me, or are they more likely to just say, I don't wanna do it? I don't wanna do it. Right, and so they're presenting themselves as having a primary willingness issue when the truth is that willingness is just coming along after the fact that a primary, you know, unable, un, uh, a, oh, sorry, unaware, unable, or unsuitable issue has come up. I know that's a lot of babbling, but do you guys get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So if someone presents themselves as being unwilling, I would really encourage you to just pause for a few moments and do a little bit deeper dive to find out if it is a primary issue or is that a secondary issue. And so primary unwillingness issues certainly do occur, but in order for them to occur, the following uh, um, uh, has to happen is kind of like the, the, the core requirements. Number one, they uh, have the, the task has to be suitable for them. So it's a good match for them. They, they certainly um, are an appropriate person for whatever it is. It's a, it's, you know, it's a, I don't want to use a lot of words to describe suitability, but suitability is all about does it match them? And so, yeah, it matches. And they're fully able to do it. And they're fully aware of everything they need to, to do. They just don't want to do it. That's a primary willingness issue. Make sense? Yep. 
So how often have you dealt with client issues or with someone inside of a client situation who you would kind of go like, well, no, this is a good, this is a, this matches them. They know what they need to be doing. They've got the skill. They've got all the resources they need. They're fully aware of everything that's, that uh, they need to be aware of. Uh, they just, for whatever reason, do not want to do this. Mm -hmm. All right. Have you guys encountered that ever or enough to, yeah. to kind of go like, no, that's a real I'm thing? Afraid, I'm afraid that's what I'm going to encounter. Oh, do tell. <laughs> well, with this this lady manager. Okay. You know, yeah. that, she's just, that she's just really unwilling to consider the people aspects of, of her responsibilities. All right. There you go. And you said that's a husband and wife team? Well, uh, yeah, the husband and wife both work for the company, both report to the CEO separately. Oh, okay. Are they at the same level? Um, no, no. Authority? She's a manager and he's a VP. Oh, okay, fine. All right. So, well, you got to deal with that dynamic too. But here goes. If someone is having a true willingness issue, then what is lacking is sufficient leadership. Hmm. Okay, now that's going to be a really, really important thing. Um, because what's a leader's real job? If we go back to what these core skills of leadership are, a leader is articulating a compelling vision. Compelling vision, yeah. That's right. They are the ones who are awakening and sustaining desire in the hearts of others. They're yeah. creating and um, uh, sustaining an environment of pride. So we'll, we'll just stick with those three. That's what they're doing. Well, if well, what should be the outcome of uh, of a leader's work if they are you know delivering that compelling vision they are making sure they're touching everybody at that heart level they are making everybody feel good about what they are and what they're doing and what the company is doing and all that should we end up with a greater level of willingness across the board I would yeah. certainly hope so. I would certainly hope so. And yeah. so to me, the hallmark indicator of a good leader is people's willingness to do the right things in the right way, the right time, the right whatever, without pushback, without, I mean, again, they still need to be aware. If they're not aware, then fine, we might get secondary um, um, willingness issues or if they're unable to do it you know i don't need to go through the whole thing but you guys you guys get it and so i'll give you one example and again um we're just talking about here the leadership role right now the u.s is um still dealing with uh people who are resistant to the vaccine for whatever reasons and i've got plenty of friends who are uh, of the same uh, mindset um and that's fine you know i respect people want to have their their individual right and all that but it kind of makes me wonder if i'm not being a very good leader when i'm working with them because and then i, I will just say this I, I believe even more so that uh, that it's I, it's not appropriate for me to try to do if we're talking about a society as a whole. Yes, but when it comes to dealing with these individuals, I still don't know um, how often or how deeply I should put my nose <laughs> into other people's business. I just tell them if they get sick with COVID, I'm going to kill them. So, because you know, they, they had plenty. So it's like, you know, one way or another. So anyway, um, but I just go like, it's all about leadership around any kind of these issues, particularly if you're talking about something at the societal level, you need to have leadership and pride-based leadership. One of the things it says is that all leaders, so leaders are not an individual. They tend to be a team of people that leadership must speak through a single unified voice. And what that single unified voice um, expects from people is that they will set aside what their own personal feelings, whatever, set them aside because they have chosen to be a leader. They've chosen to support this particular uh, company or agenda or whatever. And that leadership attempt overall must speak through a single uniform voice. 
So no matter who is speaking, I'm hearing the same message. And that message can't contain an element of doubt or any kind of a, a conditional sort of statement when one person is delivering it versus another person. So there has to be absolute consistency in the message and the delivery of that message. So is that happening right now or not so much? Not so much in, in so many much. cases. Like I think about these in, in healthcare, the nurses that are walking out in the hospital in New York where the whole entire OBGYN unit walked out and they can't deliver babies right now because they don't want to get vaccinated. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. And, and again, now, and to me, rather than mandating it, to me, mandating is, uh, what do we say? Um, how do I do this? Oh, I'm just going to say it and just chalk this up to my reaction to my third dose. <laughs> but I think it's a coward's way mm -hmm. of dealing with a lack of leadership. Yep. So yep. if the message had been compelling, had been stated properly, had been consistently reinforced, et cetera, um, then I don't know that we'd have to be forcing anybody to do much of anything. Right. But the so thought a that a, a mandate is a substitute for effective leadership is uh, just, um, I mean, that's just tragic. So anywho, um, so, okay. Any thoughts on, on this idea that an unwillingness issue is a reflection on leadership? Yes. So how can no. these deal with uh, context, would you say? The unwilling, unable, unsuitable... Oh, well, there's context involved in every one of them because it's going to be activity specific. I can be very willing to do one thing and unwilling to do another thing. And these things can happen in rapid succession. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, bounce around, bounce around. Um, so, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Okay, anything else then about willingness? Again, it's all about leadership. And I bring it up because who's got to be the leader when you're working with your clients? You. You. And so I, this is when I, I would want you guys to just kind of know, if you've got a client who's unwilling to do something and it's got nothing to do with awareness or ability or suitability, I will say a great deal of, in, of my problems with executives, it ends up being a suitability issue. They might have risen through the ranks, but they never should have. And they end up in a job that's just not the right job for them to have. We talk often about how we keep promoting salespeople into sales management. Right. That doesn't mean that was a suitable task for them. And so we have to kind of take responsibility a lot of times for how we go about promoting people inside of an organization. We got to think a little bit more about suitability as we uh, work our way through this. But, you know, if you're dealing with a client and you go like, no, nope, they're aware, they're able, that's suitable, but you know what? They just don't want to do it. Well, you either need to become the leader or you have to um, work with that person's actual leader who obviously now you know has a leadership gap themselves, or you have to try to awaken that leader within that individual. And uh, in the world of human development, that's in the long run going to serve them far better than you being their leader. It's fine for you to do that short term, but long term, obviously, it becomes uh, impractical. Um, so if we can do something to help that person become a better leader of themselves, I think we've done the best thing that we can do, um, eliciting the support of whoever that person might report to or whoever the leader might be over a particular task. Um, could be effective on a broader um, range in the company because if they're being ineffective with this individual, they're probably being ineffective um, in more general terms. And so maybe that opens up an opportunity for you to help someone with their actual leadership skills. Um, but yeah, and I, I know I'm babbling a little bit, but um, it's because I'm kind of keep introducing elements from pride-based leadership. Um, I think that Again, as a way of re, uh, to repeat this, when it comes to people doing leadership training and leadership coaching and leadership development, I don't believe that they're focusing on what we consider to be the central skills of being a leader. 
And because they're not focusing on those central skills, while they might be improving lots of other things that this person might be doing, are they really making them a better leader? So I, I don't mind saying again, if we're not helping people to more clearly articulate a compelling vision, if we're not helping them to awaken and sustain desire in the hearts of other people, if we're not helping them to create and maintain environments of pride, uh, then we're not focusing on the core um, unique skills of being a leader. So maybe what we're talking to them about is really a management skill or some other category we could plunk that skill into, but it's not leadership. So anyway, so there you go. Okay, thoughts about leadership, thoughts about, um, yeah, anything? Well, we were, we were getting tension up to the threshold so that we could uh, prevent, prevent a, a cratering of it. Coming yep. up. Okay, good. And so that leaves the last un that you need to explore in the black step is about suitability. How often have you found yourself working with a client who is either currently in a situation that is simply not a good match for them, or they're in a situation that moving forward is not the best match for them? Yeah. Yeah, oh, I've met plenty of those. Yeah, particularly if you do career counseling. Uh, you'll find a lot of this issue coming up there about suitability. So maybe you're in a situation where you're, you're going to be held back because there's not as much opportunity for advancement. There's a reason why people who want to climb the corporate ladder will move between different corporations uh, because they might have an opportunity to move up and then come back and, you know, whatever the, the game happens to end up being. But there's lots of reasons why uh, you might come up talking about suitability. Now, for you to deal with issues of suitability, you don't need to be their manager. You don't need to be their trainer. You don't need to be their leader. You need to be their counselor. Because this means you're going to have to talk to them about decisions they've made in the past and decisions they're going to be making in the future and how they've handled those decisions. And that might mean you're doing a little bit more, I'm not going to say hardcore therapy, but you're going to get more into those counseling issues around them. How do they feel about what they're doing? What do they think is going to continue to happen? But that's a little different kind of a thing because now instead of being so strategic in your work with them, now you're working more inside of the individual uh, with compassion, helping them to uh, see, understand, uh, hopefully with you at least, disclose what they're actually feeling. What are their fears? What are their, what are their concerns? Um, that's a very different style that we move into. And while if it's a severe situation, it might be out of our wheelhouses, we still all get pulled into situations where we need to change our hat to the counselor hat. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we do that, okay, fine. That's what we're actually doing. We're dealing with issues of suitability more than anything else. And sometimes it's the suitability thing that says, you know, I'm in the right job. I'm just in the right job at the wrong company. So because of the, that company's culture or because of, of internal politics inside of a certain thing, you're an employee that can do a really, really good job, but you find yourself constantly frustrated by whatever it is that you got to deal with every day just to get a day's work done. Well, mm -hmm. now the suitability issue that we'd be counseling you about is is are you ready to move on? Are you ready to look there? Or are you one of those people who think that if you stay there long enough, you'll be able to change it or they'll improve? Uh, do you not recognize you're in an abusive situation or a toxic environment? And the belief that someday it's going to change all by itself or you can do something to change it? <laughs> uh, well, maybe, but probably not so much. Yeah. So, you know, now what am I counseling you on? You know, you're, you're departing, but you got to still let go. You still got to let go. All right. So like the yeah. pandemic had brought on a lot of this. Like I just read, I think as 4 million people recently quit their jobs. Yep. And Business Insider, I think it said four out of 10 are quitting um, brought on by the pandemic. They're no longer just going to tolerate, yep. uh, you know, the, the toxic cultures and things like that. Yep, yep, yep. 
So lots of that's going on. And I know some of it's also practical, but right now there is no shortage of job opportunities. Um, there's really is a shortage of people to fill those roles. And that means that suddenly it is an, an employment seekers market, not uh, the employers market. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that means that the employees, at least for now, get to call more of the shots. I mean, it's just like real estate, you know, if you think about it, <laughs> it's real estate. And hey, so T, can I, yep. ask, you, can I sure. ask you a question? Sure. Th think for a moment about the master stream and about the interviewing process, since we're talking about the uh, turnover tsunami, the uh, great resignation. Mm -hmm. Do you see, I, I can see the interviewing process mapped to the master stream. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Because ultimately now, me as that prospective employer, I've got to sell that person on why they want to come to work for us. Yep. And so I better be doing a thorough job of questioning so that I can present the opportunity in the most compelling way. And boy, I better not lower that level of tension. By the way, David, this is going to be where you guys pick up on Tuesday. Yeah, okay. Talking about, and the, the issue, of course, is that we have a tendency as human development professionals to uh, give too much guidance, too much support, too much, too much, too much. And the more we give them, the better we equip them, the more knowledge, the more skill, the more experience, the more resources we give people, the lower and lower and lower and lower and lower that tension is going to go. Mm. And unfortunately, we have to rebuild that or wait till circumstances outside of ourself uh, reoccur and rebuild that level of tension for them to put that together. So if we are not very judicious in our selection and delivery of solutions, uh, we are going to end up undermining that person's forward movement. And that's on us. That's not yep. the, that's not that person. That's on us. Yep. And so we have to in chemistry, the word is titrate. We have to very carefully control the amount of that solution. Think of the solution as being, well, a solution, a reagent in a solution. Reagents can cause reactions. So we want to make sure that we are always delivering just the right dose of solution in just the right way at just the right time for it to have maximum impact on that person's situation. Um, so yeah, so um, Brian, you can come up with a, with a medical a metaphor to go along with why it is we do not want to administer the entire pharmacopoeia to every single patient. <laughs> yeah, the door. yeah, we use meds, so minimum effective doses, because if you start it off with a maximum, it literally will kill you. Yeah, so you give right. people a minimum that creates a maximum effect. That's right. That's right. And so this is all, it's the same thing. Think of our input as human development professionals as being, I don't want to call it drugs, but we're vitamins, we're medications, mm -hmm. we are some sort of nutrient. We're sad. We're the salve. There you go. So we, we're, we're all those kinds of things. We don't need to overdo it. We need to know just how much to administer at just the right time in just the right format in order to achieve that. And that's why this un stuff is so important, because how I package and follow through on phase three is going to be different if they're unaware than it would be if they were unwilling or unable or unsuitable. It's, it's going to be a different blend. Uh, of whatever interventions are going to be necessary. So that, that needs to be the focus as you guys continue these discussions. David, I'll make sure you are well positioned to be able to uh, do that. I'll give you just some questions you might want to throw at everybody yep. if they don't seem to be <laughs> filling the time the way you want. <laughs> uh, and I think because Lynn will be on the call, she can still initiate the the recording. So you don't you probably won't need to be worrying about recording them and right. how we're going to get to those recordings. Um, OK, anyway, uh, that's uh, that's it for now. So uh, everybody just uh, uh, have yourself a wonderful next uh, few weeks. I will be aboard a cruise ship going for 20 days down to the south uh, southern caribbean so there you go yeah brian any errands you need me to run while i'm down there family members you need me to see 
<laughs> sure, bring, bring back some uh, good fruit. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I don't think they let us bring that on board. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> some or agricultural some nice concerns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rum, they'll definitely let you bring back. But, you know, we're going to uh, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao. And oh, so yeah. I think these are all Dutch um, yes. islands. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Anyway, that's the story. So talk to you guys uh, uh, later and um, enjoy your circle of brilliance as it continues. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank Bye, you. Thanks. Take care. Bye for now.